the experience in understanding what is, is reflected in the documents. Uh, intelligence, in essence, is the enemy point of view. Trying to understand what the enemy's intentions are and to anticipate what they might try to do to you, whether in peace or war. Information in the absence of intelligence is pretty much useless. So it takes a bit of intelligence in the, in the outset to be able to deal with the information that you may or may not have. Uh, intelligence is something that Karl von Clausewitz did talk about. He gave about two and a half pages worth uh, in his you know, grand book, but the, the underlying theme of the entire book is intelligence. Uh, what I like about how Clausewitz deals with intelligence is he describes it as a, a, a theatrical scene. It's, it's an opera with you know, apparitions flying around in the theater, and it's up to the intelligence analyst to, to make sense of it all. Uh, strategy is all about the desired end. So if your desired end is war, you'll probably have a war. Uh, if you're using your intelligence properly to manage your enemy point of view uh, and your desired end is to avoid the war, then hopefully intelligence enables you to achieve that desired end. Uh, we're going to have papers on these themes today. That's why I'm sort of waxing poetic about these, these big ideas. The policy is important. The, po the policy has to drive the strategy. So it's incumbent upon the strategist to explain to the policymaker that if you don't have a clear policy about what you're trying to achieve, there's no way I can provide a strategy to achieve it. Uh, and then I would, I would quote Stephen B. Luce, the founder of the Naval War College, when he talks about naval strategy. He said, uh, all naval operations are strategic, whether in peace or war. Okay, with that, we have three papers today. Uh, the first from David Hatch, who's a, a, a very accomplished historian of uh, signals intelligence, and uh, he's, he's talked uh, on numerous occasions about all the different facets of signals intelligence throughout history. Uh, and today he, he will be talking about the Zimmerman telegram, the famous message from Arthur Zimmerman to uh, the German uh, foreign representative in Mexico City, which ultimately is one of the factors of many that got us uh, the United States involved directly in the First World War. Uh, the second paper is from uh, Betsy Smoot, uh, who is going to be talking about uh, the skirmishes on the home front. Now, for those of us who have worked in the Navy, uh, we know that bureaucracy is something that is real. It's both your friend and your enemy. And Betsy will be talking about that in primarily the First World War context, but, but also beyond that. And then Paul Thompson will talk about Harold Stark, the chief of naval operations on that day of days, December 7th, 1941, and how Harold Stark has a role in shaping the perspective of the policymaker. In that case, it's Franklin Delano Roosevelt, famously. And Paul will be telling us uh, some fresh perspectives on how intelligence informed uh, Franklin Roosevelt's decision-making process uh, in anticipation of the Second World War. And with that, uh, I will ask David Hatch to go ahead and launch uh, your, your paper. Houston? We have a problem. <laughs> Is David Hatch present? So I'm David Hatch. My name is David Hatch. Um, and uh, let me tell you about the Zimmerman telegram. Um, if, if David Hatch comes into the conversation, is there somebody added? Do we have a David Hatch at all? Check. Uh, that's not David Hatch. That's Paul. So uh, Betsy, if, if you're up for it, can we go ahead and yep. kick off? I can do that. I don't see Dave. I'm not sure what's going on, but let me uh, launch. When you're ready, Betsy. I'm going. Let me just get there. Hi. This paper is adapted from a paper called a uh, book I've got coming out from the ground up American cryptology during World War One which is forthcoming from the Center for Cryptologic History in the spring, I hope, of 2022. And it was given in another form at the Naval War College in January 2017. 
In November 1918, as the guns fell silent on the Western Front, the U.S. Army and the Navy began a battle over a radio intercept facility that likely hindered intelligence efforts to monitor post-armistice German policy and intentions. No real government cryptologic effort existed when the U.S. entered the war in 1917, but both services were using radio and understood the potential for radio intercept. Long distance radio communications were critical to Germany, which lost its undersea cable communications when the British cut them on August 4th, 1914, in what is possibly the first denial of service attack. The cable cuts are of course what makes the British intercept of the Zimmerman telegram possible. In the wake of the revelations in the telegram, the US became more aware of the criticality of German radio links to Mexico, and both the army and Navy wished to intercept these communications. The Navy clearly had the lead in understanding, using, and controlling radio, for it had broad de facto control of radio operations in the United States. The Army had been permitted to control radio needed for Army purposes. The small radio tractor units on the Mexican border hadn't really bothered the Navy, neither had the Army operations in the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City. As early as 1904, the Navy's interest in radio were recognized as paramount to all others, but the Army retained the right to use radio as needed for operations. The Navy led the way on thinking about the strategic value of radio, radio intercept, and improved radio technology. They used their ability to charge lower rates for some commercial traffic to incentivize shipping companies to shift from older spark systems to the Navy's preferred continuous wave radio technology. Well before the start of the Great War then, then Lieutenant Stanford C. Hooper, the father of naval radio, expressed concern about the station at Sayville, Long Island, owned by a subsidiary of the German company Telefunken, and the potential for such stations to be used by spies to disrupt critical naval radio traffic. In 1913, Hooper, a man ahead of his time, suggested that the U.S. set up a station in Germany to monitor and intercept German traffic. This was not done. You may be asking why Maine? This most northeastern of the states is an ideal location to receive signals from Europe. As early as 1915, there was recognition of the excellent propagation environment there, and there were multiple stories about secret German radio transmissions coming from the state. Two local immigrant radio amateurs, the Fabry brothers, were briefly under suspicion for their radio work. But they were loyal to the U.S., and in the summer of 1917, the brothers leased the station they had built and equipped to the U.S. government for $1 a year, and the Bar Harbor Otter Cliffs station opened on August 28, 1917. One of the brothers, Alessandro, became a Navy lieutenant and was put in command. The Navy moved in on a massive scale. More than 100 Navy enlisted and 25 Marines were assigned here during the war. It was the Navy's primary transatlantic receiving station. A transmitting station nearby Seawall was added in 1918. It is important to note that up until this time, there was very little difference made between a station that received radio messages and an intercept station. In many circumstances, the first intercept operations were conducted by radio operators during their downtime when they weren't sending or receiving official traffic. The separation of these duties was an outgrowth of the war. Otter Cliffs both intercepted adversarial communications and received full Navy radio traffic. Once the Navy had a site in Maine, why did the War Department's Military Intelligence Division, MID, want one? They had a successful system of radio tractor units deployed the U.S.-Mexico border, Mexican border by early 1918, but were very aware of the long distance German radio stations that broadcast to much of the world. It was believed that collection of these broadcasts from German stations would provide communications intelligence support to post-armistice peace talks. The Army, with troops on the ground in Europe and concerns that the war could resume, wanted this type of intelligence. The cryptologic relationship between the Army and Navy was more often strained than cooperative. In the fall of 1917, John A. Graham, one of the young officers in training in Herbert O. Yardley's MI8 code and cipher section, was sent to the Navy Department for some reason and decades later remembered, here in Washington, I suffered one of my great disillusionments, which made Pearl Harbor conditions no surprise to me. As an officer from civilian life, I naively believed that we were all in the war together. I discovered the Army and Navy Departments did not share this belief. 
One morning, armed with proper credentials from the head of Army Intelligence, I called at the Navy Department to request, on behalf of the Army, certain information which we believe, had reason to believe the Navy had. The Naval officer, who received me very courteously but firmly, refused, for reasons which he said he could not divulge, to share their information on the subject with the Army. Right there on the spot was born my enthusiasm for a unified military command. Still, by the beginning of 1918, the Navy would sometimes send coded or ciphered messages intercepted by the Otter Cliffs facility, other Navy radio stations, or ships at sea to MI-8 for analysis. And in June 1918, the Navy sent a liaison officer to work in MI-8, but there were still conflicts ahead. The Navy's Otter Cliff Station, although not originally intended as a radio intelligence collection site, did intercept messages from the German station at Nauen. Otter Cliff was a robust effort, a transatlantic Navy radio station which did significant experimental work in which the Navy had invested $80,000 by the time of the armistice. That's about $1.5 million today. An operator at Otter Cliffs named Herbert C. Hovenden remembered that on the evening of October 6, 1918, four operators were in Nowen when Nowen's bird is transmitting in English. Sensing the importance of the message, they summoned the executive officer, Raymond Cole, and Cole, who read over Hovenden's shoulder, tore the intercept off the machine and ran down the stairs to telegraph the information to Washington. When he returned, he grabbed more of the intercept and quickly set it off. When he returned again, he told Hovenden that a direct wire to Washington was being held open for the remainder of the message. The precise details of this message are not clear, but Hovenden believed it was a proposed armistice. Then on October 12th, Otter Cliffs copied another message from Nowen that is said to have been the German reply to President Wilson's January offer for a permanent peace of justice. The message was signed by the German foreign minister. Ottercliffe started sending the text through to Washington while the message was in progress, beating out a similar message that had been sent via cable. Now the Army MID got word of the message and scooped the Navy by taking the news to Wilson, thereby getting credit for the information. Rupert Hughes, MI-10, and Howard Hughes's uncle later dramatically recounted the story. A curious thing happened on a holiday, Columbus Day, October 12, 1918. President Wilson New York to speak at a public banquet. The military intelligence offices were closed. Only a few were in our office, only one at Navy Intelligence. Pressure of work brought me down to my desk. A telephone message came from the lone officer at Naval Intelligence. A strange radio message had come through the ether, purporting to be from somebody in Germany and signed by the unfamiliar name of Swaff. He was the Secretary of State of the German Foreign Office, and he called across the world to President Wilson, a willingness to accept the terms proposed long ago by Wilson. I rushed with this message to General Churchill, the head of the MID, who was also at his desk, what to do, how to get this secret lead to President Wilson. After much debate, General Churchill called Delmonico's restaurant in New York on the telephone and had Wilson's Secretary Tumulty called. Taking all precautions against being overheard, General Churchill repeated Swaff's radio message and Tumulty conveyed it to Wilson. Next morning, I went in very early to the Naval Intelligence Office myself in the hope of picking up another plum. The sheepish officers informed me that I had already raised enough hell and Secretary Daniels was roaring like a lion over having such a scoop picked out of the Navy's hands by the Army. Henceforth, we were to get no more tips. Intercept Hughes shared came from Otter Cliffs. Perhaps the MID had assumed that since the Navy used MI8 to break cipher messages, that they had the right to use information from the site at Otter Cliffs freely. Although the October 12th message was not in code or cipher, Hughes had learned of it, and perhaps it made MID realize they were not getting all the information collected by the Navy, and that there was useful information coming from now and that could be used to the Army's political advantage. This event is surely what triggered MID to put an Army intercept station in Maine. MID moved quickly. By October 19, 1918, one week after the Navy message was shared with Wilson, it had decided they needed their own intercept station devoted to the collection of communications from now on. The order to proceed was given on October 28th. The Gillen Farm east of town was rented. The enlisted men arrived on November 11th. They came from Texas, 10 poles for antenna wire by the 12th, and on the 13th of November, the Army's first fixed intercept site in U.S. territory was given the designation Radio Tractor Unit 49, despite not being a radio tractor, 
and was in operation. The Navy's objection to the Holton facility came fast and furious, and this is the Gillen Farm. Without knowing the Hughes story, these objections seem inexplicable, and the official documents provide no rationale for the Navy's behavior. The Navy's indignation and the subsequent long argument over the Army's efforts at Holton only makes sense within the context of Robert Hughes's scoop. Holton's intercept was forwarded to Washington by telegraph with no more than a 30-minute delay. By November, MI-8 was working in ciphered traffic from Holton. Everything was in place for intelligence support to the peace talks, then scheduled to begin in mid-December. But the Navy saw Holton as competition for and duplication of Otter Cliffs. At a cabinet meeting, Secretary of the Navy Josephus Daniels protested the operation of an Army station so close to a Navy station, and the Secretary of War, Newton Baker, had little option but to order the MID to shut down collection operations. The Navy likely considered long-distance transatlantic radio strictly its responsibility, particularly as it was a stretch to claim that Holton was, inter Holton was intended to support Army operations. On November 20th, a week after the intercept had begun in earnest, the order came from the Secretary of War to halt operations immediately. MID placed Holton on experimental status on November 23rd. Marlborough Churchill, then director of the MID, wanted to leave the equipment in place with the hope operations would resume during the peace conference. He decided to reorganize the station for experimental work. This is an experimental DF antenna they put in the barn. You can see the markings on the Aware that the change status might hurt operational morale, Churchill sent a memo to the site noting that operations were not discontinued because it was considered unimportant, but in fact the opposite, that all efforts being made to resume operations showed how important Holton was for the Army during the period of armistice in the peace conference. And possibly for some time afterwards, the site was asked to be ready to resume work immediately directed. Interestingly, and pr probably in violation of the MID's promise to the Navy, the site was instructed in late November to collect the code messages transmitted by the Mexican station at Chapultepec each night and to watch for any related transmissions. A cryptologic breakthrough had happened at MIA on November 13th. A message from Chapultepec intercepted by a radio tractor earlier in the month was broken, the first break in many months. The message showed a relationship between Chapultepec and the now on transmitter. Holton could hear now, and so MI-8 hoped they'd intercept messages that could not be copied on the Mexican border. While listening for Chapultepec on December 12th, Holton intercepted 14 cipher messages sent between Berlin and Madrid. Seven of these were deciphered in December, and MI-8 sent word to Holton that the high, they were of the highest importance and wanted them collected as they were the confidential communications of a German minister. The Navy cited Ottercliffs had not copied these messages. They were unique to Holton. MA8 consulted with the Office of Naval Intelligence, and the Navy's radio communications department said that the Navy had received no German cipher messages in the past two months. In fact, MI8 was informed that the Navy were no longer paying attention to the German cipher messages, and that Captain Todd, chief of radio communications, had expressed himself as in favor of the immediate resumption of operations by Holton. Despite documented continued Navy opposition as recently as December 14th, once General Churchill learned of Todd's comments, his, well, once his successor, Colonel John Dunn, learned of Todd's comments, he ordered Holton to resume intercept on December 19th. Dunn expressed hope that complete and definite instructions for the site were forthcoming. But this hope was extremely short lived. The next day, December 20th, the site was told once again to dis discontinue intercept operations. So the peace negotiations began in January without the benefit of intelligence from Holton Intercept. While the site experimented, the MID continued the campaign to restore the Intercept mission. In January, Dunn sent a memo to the War Department Chief of Staff with a su suggested draft of a letter to the Secretary of War for him to send to the Secretary of the Navy in regard to the work at Holton. His argument rested on the cipher messages intercepted in December, and he asked the Secretary of the Navy to recognize as desirable the employment of the radio receiving station at Holton, giving his consent to the, for the confidential assistance of the military intelligence division. It is not clear when the message was sent and what the Secretary of Navy said in response, but on April 20th, 1919, Holton finally began to intercept work.
This pleased the men of the police as they found the experimental work not just very monotonous, but sometimes something that should have been done by civilians with laboratory facilities. MI8 was also pleased as cipher messages were now coming in regularly. About half of the collected messages were easily read and the other half were being vigorously worked on. On May 1st, Holton was told to focus on messages, uh, cipher messages rather than plain text press. 98 enciphered messages were collected in the first two weeks. Holton was providing timely, actionable intelligence, and MI8 noted they were all diplomatic messages and that in certain cases they had been decoded, translated, and put before the United States Secretary of State before they were intended. Holton's collection of the German transmitter at Elvise was determined to be a unique intercept of both diplomatic traffic and propaganda. It seemed that Otter Cliffs was only collecting the plain text press from now on and not the enciphered traffic from Elvise. The possibility of sharing information with the Navy was broached in May 1919. It was thought the Navy could receive the now in collection from the Navy, but whether this happened is unknown. To their great relief, the enlisted men at Holton were demobilized in August 1919. This threw the station into a transition period from which it never recovered. Yardley specifically tasked Holton in late September, requesting that the site intercept code sent between Madrid and Vienna, Madrid and Sofia, and Madrid and Morocco, noting that these codes could now be broken. But operations began to falter in January 1920. The site was unable to intercept a station because the Navy station at Sayville, Long Island, was operating on the same wavelength. The last traffic appears to have been copied in April or May 1920. In May, control of Holton was given to MI personnel in the Northeastern Department. The lease on the farm ended in June. By August, as part of the reorganization of the Army, responsibility for whatever remained of the site moved to the Signal Corps in the newly created 1st District. Holton had numerous problems because of how it was set up, the involuntary work stoppages, and Army reorganization. The MID was not really prepared to operate a fixed site. While tasking procedures and the collection process seem to have been relatively smooth, the materiel and logistics problems were always an issue and never really solved. Holton was remote from support in a very different way from the units on the Mexican border. Many of Holton's frustrations were caused by the inability of the Northeastern Department's quartermaster in Boston to provide what they needed, which necessitated MID headquarters in Washington supplying basics such as paper and typewriter ribbon. Demobilization of the most experienced operators and the inability of the peacetime army to supply qualified personnel made Holton only a marginally successful site after August 1919. Harold W. Kastner, an operator at all of Otter Cliffs, would later write of the station at Holton. At all events, the Army did establish some kind of a receiving station at Holton, Maine. I have no doubt but what reception was good and that it might have been of some assistance to the government in these communications, but we always felt that their hope was to exceed the results of the Navy, and even that much concern was had over beating us. We received several official letters and even copies of various schedules, but they indicated they were simply making a comparison of their copy with Bar Harbor. To this day, I think it was an earnest endeavor to be of service, but I do feel that the Army personnel entertain hopes of showing the Navy something. Otter Cliffs was a much more successful, much more successful as a facility and was only decommissioned in 1933 because it was moved to Winter Harbor when the Navy donated Otter Cliffs to the National Park Service's new Acadia National Park. Winter Harbor Station, later Naval Security Group Activity Winter Harbor, was decommissioned in 2002, and its land was also transferred to the National Park Service. There's a monument to Fabry in the park today. If you visit Acadia National Park, you'll find the Fabry Monument near a picnic area and a rest stop. The toilet facilities there are built on part of the land that housed the intercept station. The Army was at a disadvantage in this battle. It had a later start at radio operations, did not have a decade or more of strategic thought behind radio work, and did not have the political influence the Navy enjoyed. The MID took advantage of their access to naval intelligence to leverage establishment of a station at Holton. But both the Holton and the Otter Cliff stations made progress in radio experiments and direction finding that would benefit future intercept operations, and both stations made important contributions to the field of radio intelligence. Holton, the town, remained an excellent spot for radio and became a hub of long-distance radio telephone transmission from Europe by 1927. The Army would not begin to have significant fixed intercept stations on U.S. territory until the 1930s. 
Although the intelligence collected in Maine between 1918 and 1920 was, in the long run, largely insignificant, the victory ultimately went to the Navy. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy, for that really informative paper. And I, I got to say that when you zero in on these remote stations, you, you, you really conjure up sort of the, the pioneering days, I think, uh, with, with all of that. Um, so do we have David? Is David Hatch? Do you see him at all? I don't either. So um, if, that's, if that's all right, Paul, if you're ready to go, um, We'll, we'll hope that David Hatch can join us, but uh, if you want to go ahead and kick off with your paper uh, on Admiral Stark and his influence on Franklin Roosevelt's policy. Paul, do you uh, need me to run your slides? Houston, we're going around the moon. Um, Paul seems to be muted. Paul? Hello. Can we unmute Paul? I don't know. You're in the NSA, Betsy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot unmute Paul. I don't know if you are able to do this. <laughs> Let me send him an email. If anything, uh, we could have a conversation with Betsy. On, on we can do day. that. Uh, Let me see uh, if we can get raise him on uh, Messenger. Hello. Oh. Unless the Paul, poor Paul, the cable company was outside. I am here. Well, there you go. Are you there? I've got your slides. Do you want me to share them? Yes, please. When I say next slide, next slide, please. Okay. Okay. Talk about a loss of signal, everybody. They're working on the cable line outside. This loss of signal has been brought to you by Spectrum, so we're going old school. Um, good, good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me clearly? Mm, yeah, more or less. Okay. Apparently, I have a face for radio, as they used to say. Okay. Um, so I, for, first, I'd like to thank uh, the United States Naval Academy for hosting this. I'd also like to thank the midshipmen in the back for making certain that the tech works um, and for their service. And I'd like to thank everybody for joining us, whether you're there in person or like myself in the ether, uh, for this discussion on a SIG, SIGINT apocalypse during another apocalypse. And perhaps maybe we can together have have some discussions on lessons learned uh, in, in this topic to perhaps uh, avoid a future apocalypse, given the fact that the area in question uh, being discussed uh, today is also a hotbed of controversy in the news now for entirely different reasons. Okay, so without further ado, next slide, please. Uh, today, today I am here to talk to you about Stark Matters, which is a play on words, how Roosevelt's War Council used, abused, and ignored uh, Pacific War Signal Intelligence. There has been an immense amount of research done since the Pearl Harbor attack on Pearl Harbor. In fact, it seems to be a center of gravity in the literature uh, for uh, discussions on uh, uh, different levels whether one thinks Roosevelt, like the conspiracy theorists put forward, believe that Roosevelt sacrificed the United States Navy at Pearl Harbor to get us into a war. The only difference among the conspiracy theorists is which war, to fight the Japanese or to fight the Nazis. There is a, there is a second level to this, mostly those ideas put forward by inter- inter-war uh, year service members, mostly from the Navy, who think that Roosevelt was completely incompetent. Then you have the more consensus level historians like Gordon Prang, uh, still the best book on the topic, uh, who say that there is more friction and fog involved, uh, and simply the Roosevelt administration was overwhelmed. Well, the one thing that they don't seem to reconcile at all is you have the Pearl Harbor event, and then six months later, 
one has the Battle of Midway, in which, yes, you can claim some luck, but everything went right. So how do you reconcile incompetence or malice, and then all of a sudden, we resurrect ourselves six months later? It doesn't happen that way. And the focus of today's paper is by addressing that through looking at two events, one for one after Pearl Harbor, and the role signal intelligence played in this evolution of thinking of FDR and his administration. So, who was FDR? Next slide, please. FDR and his people had come about at a time when signal intelligence wasn't all that appreciated. Late 19th century, age of sale, signal intelligence, or just signaling in code uh, w was essentially for communications. And as w we've ju just heard, the emphasis is more on code making and some little limited code breaking in the First World War. And then after the war, there is a scandal, actually a series of minor scandals and one really big scandal. Herbert Yardley decides to out uh, America's ability to listen in. And as a consequence, the 1930s and right up until World War II, a lot of people don't want to touch signal intelligence, at least not publicly, for fear of that backlash taint about what, what Stinson said was, um, gentlemen, do not read each other's mail. So, FDR, next slide, please. Comes about in his first official introduction to signal intelligence, working as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. He starts at the end of 1913, and he works in, up until 1920. Here's the key. He has no direct attachment to signal intelligence. He reads some of the documents and the performance of his work in Washington, D.C., but he is not an evaluator, he is not an analyst, and he's not really interested in the ways of gathering intelligence. In fact, one might say that he has a hobbyist perspective on intelligence gathering something from the Pulp Fiction novel. If you look at the contents of his safe at Hyde Park uh, dur during his administration, uh, you will see neat little things on gadgets, neat little things on spy versus spy, but there is no appreciation for the aggregate. Instead, FDR is looking at things as a policy wonk and as a bureaucrat. Uh, during his administration, there is a tacit initial friendship to the UK. FDR looks at what is going on in Europe, and he realizes that Hitler is a great threat. The Japanese are not that great a threat given the, the expansive ocean between us. So in 1937, he wants to prevent, actually contrary to what the conspiracy theorists would say, prevent the United States from having to go to war by quarantining uh, the Axis. In October of 1937, he put forward a quarantine policy in a speech, um, which essentially indicates that the United States would be better off applying, and I'm sorry for, for the timeliness of this, a viral approach to dealing with foreign policy. If we can contain the spread of this virus, called fascism or authoritarianism, more broadly defined, we will be able to save Europe, and we can only do this through peaceful measures. Um, he gets the backing of then CNO William Leahy to, to, to press this forward. Now, you can imagine the backlash from Congress. Congress doesn't want us involved, and he doesn't want us, therefore, pushing that we're going to help contain somebody else. Well, this brings us to the first instance of FDR's uh, presidential laying of hands on signal intelligence for the first time. Next slide, please. Signal intelligence is in its, is in its naval infancy and operational capacity in the 1930s. What little we had was coming out of the Cypher Bureau, coming out of the CNO's office in a small way dealing with uh, Op 20G, uh, 
which is a small unit that wants to actually buck the trend and start listening in on our competitors to be forewarned and therefore forearmed and hopefully prevent war. One of these new ways is in 1924, noticed after FDR had left uh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy's position, the establishment of a listening post in Shanghai in the American consulate in Shanghai to listen in on three different factions. This is later supplemented in around 1935, 1936 with mobile units, uh, in other words, spy ships. Uh, You have somebody sitting aboard a ship with a radio, with an antenna, and dispatched in this case, next slide please, to the Asiatic fleet and deep into the Yangtze River. All of a sudden, one day, FDR receives from the White House word that the Japanese have attacked a ship. You may have heard of it, the USS Panay, December 12, 1937. This ship was above board, main mission to keep the peace on the Yangtze for all parties concerned. Uh, and below board, trying to keep an eye on the Japanese who are at that point pushing into China proper and are about to seize, um, about to seize Nanking. Uh, this is further legitimized by the American consulate at Nanking, uh, making the USS Penne a backup in case their ability to talk to Washington goes down. Below the radar screen, the Pan A is not only just monitoring the situation, the Pan A is not just running communications. It's also carrying a secret Japanese bomb site that it had somehow come into for the possession of. They are watching as another set of ships run by the British who are evacuating refugees gets first moved by gunfire, artillery fire by the Japanese who have overrun this section uh, of Nanking and are trying to get them to leave. Then the next day, all of a sudden, they get strafed, the Japanese claim it was an accident, and the British pull out. The same thing happens in the same sequence a couple of days later to the Panay, FDR learns. FDR is a political animal um, the chief of naval operations, Leahy, is a, po- is a political animal, a bureaucrat, and a naval officer with experience in, in the Asian waters. So they think this is an ideal opportunity to test out this quarantine policy. They have very secretly been talking with the British about how neither of them have liked this leading up to the attack on the Panay. Now, American blood has been spilled, and FDR takes the worst possible thing he possibly could do to it to his intelligence community. He makes them part of the story. No, not just facts, but says, our ship was attacked, and I have photos, and I have video, and I have etc. And this is a tragedy, and we should get involved in this. Congress disagrees. And the British, although they were very quietly in agreement initially that something must be done, when push comes to shove and FDR says, we need to move, next slide please, Neville Chamberlain responds that he is disappointed, quote, at the course of this government when it stepped out so far ahead of the British government, in other words, He didn't want to have to read about this in the newspapers, and now Neville Chamberlain believes that FDR is trying to pressure the British unduly to enter into this. The British, however, are saying, no, we're looking at what's happening across the English Channel. We're looking at the possibility of going to war with Hitler. We can't get involved in this. And then publicly says they're going to instead send a note of complaint to the Japanese government. What happens next? FDR's first foray in SIGINT operations falls flat. 
It goes nowhere, and he drops it like a seasoned politician when he gets a backlash from both ends and goes on his merry way. So, what are we to do if you are in the CNO's office and you are working in naval intelligence? Are you going to listen to Congress saying pull out of Asia? Are you going to ne say never mind? We are not going to read anybody's mail? Well, here's the difference between what the conspiracy theorists are saying and what actually happens. It's not FDR. It's the United States Navy and a couple of different intelligence organs in the United States, ONI, OP20G, um, and the FBI and the, uh, and the United States Army who say, no, we had better invest in actually watching these people in Asia, watching these people in Europe. And you get this slow, steady trickle that starts under the CNO lady going to CNO, now Harold Stark, of money, of people to be invested in increasing the capacity to listen in. No longer are we talking about one or two little stations in Asia inside of a consulate. We're not just talking about a couple of spy ships. During this interwar period, the last couple of years, crescendoing in 1940, there is a deluge of cash being flooded into the creation of fixed listening posts scattered throughout the Pacific Rim, large antennas and personnel that, that I shall henceforth refer to as RID, which is the Radio Intelligence Division, to start plotting the tracks of various in, our, in the case of our discussion, uh, Japanese naval and Japanese army movements, their capabilities, how fast they can go as a ship, or, and what they're carrying. Conversely, there's something else that comes about at the same time. FDR isn't interested in the more mundane stuff. He's interested in him. He's interested in dealing with something he um, is better at, and that's diplomacy. All of a sudden, we are able to break into the Japanese diplomatic traffic through a program known as MAGIC. It is a shared program between the Military Intelligence Divisions, SIS, and the Navy. Next slide, please. What does MAGIC give us? MAGIC gives us, and more specifically FDR, a deep insight into the diplomatic mind of the Japanese Empire. FDR demands to see the raw form magic communiques. Why? Because he is now trying to negotiate directly with the Japanese government to stop their advance in China so that the United States does not have to take provocative action. He is going back and forth with the Japanese diplomats in D.C. who are communicating between the D.C. embassy, their consulates, and the Japanese home island to try to find a solution that doesn't make the United States enter into the war. But they are now heavily needing the supplies in China. And what FDR does not see, because he's following a more traditional naval approach of Mahanian philosophy on waypoints and on battleships, speed and strength, not subtlety, is that what is really going on are two different courses of conversation. Yes, he's being apprised of the stuff Rid is telling him, but he's discounting it because he thinks he may be able to get somewhere with this diplomatic traffic. There is a problem. Stark, Secretary of War Stimson, and several others I'll mention in a second, are only getting snapshots. They are not fully appreciating a synthesis of these two sources. And what is the result? Next slide, please. The result is that we have people who are being preferential in one way and discounting ever so slightly the other. Uh, you, you hear in movies, we know this, we know that. You look in memoirs and you read the, these various people, the Secretary of War, the CNO, the Army Chief himself, 
the head of military intelligence division, the heads of ONI, all saying, we know that the Japanese are loading transports in November of 1941. We know that they have uh, set a carrier task force into the Pacific Ocean. We know not where, but we think it's going here, uh, here or there. We know that they are arming for war. Well, how did they know this? They knew this through RID. What is the result? The result is this blindness that focuses slowly on magic and leads to an apocalyptic moment. Next slide, please. These are the assets that we had on hand in Navy, the Navy's Radio Intelligence Division. We had supplements with the Army. And they're warning everyone, you better take this seriously. And several members of ONI are saying they're going to attack us and they may be coming for Pearl Harbor. But that message is not getting to the top. And instead, next slide, please. We are getting an apocalypse moment at Pearl Harbor. So we have Stark having had to essentially funnel money into this. He realizes it's important, but we now have a broader war to deal with. We have um, the, the Secretary of War now ma having to manage a huge war, whereas in the past he was simply supplementing the, the war effort through orders of requisitions of material, planes, ships, etc., trying to bulk up our forces on two fronts and us not being able to accomplish either very well. Next slide, please. So, what's FDR to make of this? December, the end of December 7th, 1941, FDR realizes that they've been had, that they have duped themselves. And as a consequence of this, they dump even more money, they dump even more personnel, they dump everything that they possibly can into saving what's left of the Pacific Fleet. The Pacific Fleet is now anchored in two different places, one protecting Hawaii and rescuing the survivors of the Pearl Harbor attack and hopefully rebuilding the fleet there. And the smaller fleet elements are sent out to try to keep the Japanese off balance. We can't read their military codes, but we can see something big is going on. And this two-pronged approach does indeed somewhat slow down the Japanese. However, it doesn't slow down something you probably haven't heard. On the late afternoon of December 7th, Admiral Nimitz at Hawaii notes in his log that they have just spotted at least seven Japanese submarines called I-boats heading towards the West Coast. What happens next? Over the next several weeks, the next several months, I-boats are starting to take out American ships. There are not many I-boats, but they are fairly effective. And we cannot stop them. How do you launch a counteroffensive in the Pacific with this going on? How do you rescue the people in Hawaii and protect the people in Hawaii when one, our Navy is, is on its heels, and two, any relief you send outwards is going to probably come under attack. Well, FDR does the best thing he possibly could. It's a lesson for all presidents. You take a step back and you let the military fight the war. What we have is FDR telling everyone, you've got to work together, and he um, signs an executive order that pools the resources of all the intelligence apparatuses and a couple you probably never heard of, including the FCC, to start tracking the movements of these Japanese IBOs. They come up with a pattern. The pattern is whenever the Japanese I-boats attack the West Coast, oh. they almost all transit back West, passing Midway Island, and turn their guns on Midway Island. 
The second pattern that they see is that like a swift clock, they are reliable. Every 12 hours, these iBoats surface. They broadcast messages at home, which we believe is a status report, and then the home island sends them their next set of mission orders every 12 hours. And the people in Op20G, the people in RID, the people in the Army all realize this is an asset we can use. Ladies and gentlemen, this is knowledge-based warfare at its finest. We may not be able to understand what they're saying, but we can plot where they're moving. So how do we deal with this if we're taking our fleet in these two different capacities I previously mentioned, trying to keep the enemy off balance? We don't have that many assets to risk surface ships, and the rest of our surface ships are protecting Hawaii. Oh, we we Hello? Yes? So we, we hit time. Okay. Uh, let me, let uh, me finish up? Yeah, I'll let you finish up. Uh, Okay. Well, okay. Last, last slide. I'm right, I'm right at the end. Very good. Uh, so, what do we do? We detail a sub, the USS Grundon, Grundon, which is a Gatto class submarine, to interdict one of them, and we torpedo it, we sink it. And this is why, ladies and gentlemen, the I boat threat essentially disappears from the Eastern Pacific. What FDR did was he allowed everyone to work together, he funded it, and he let us let us work out ourselves how we could ambush the enemy. And isn't this essentially how we won later on at the Battle of Midway? Uh, thank you all. Um, if, if David's here, I'll shut up and we can deal with questions, or if you wish, if I can go to the last slide, um, if you wish, we can do discussions now. At your pleasure. Do, do, do your last slide. Okay. Nice? Jump to the last slide. Uh, for, for a last note on those conspiracy theorists, I give you uh, Robert Heinlein, class of 1929 at Annapolis. Never attribute malice to that which can be adequately explained by stupidity. Never underestimate the power of human stupidity. And never underestimate a president's ability to learn from his mistakes. Thank you all. Go Navy. Uh, Paul, thank you very much for a wonderful <laughs> presentation. Uh, Betsy, thank you. Uh, do we have a David Hatch at all? I, I don't think we do. And believe it or not, the signal is back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, yeah. I'm going to try to enter. So if you got questions or not, what not for Betsy, by all means, just give me a couple of minutes to get back into the room. Very good. Uh, I'm going to do some summary remarks based on the presentations that we've had. Uh, I wish we could have had David Hatch's presentation, which I've heard a variation of in the past. He has some very interesting material about the Zimmerman telegram uh, that he has conjured up in his research. Um, I, I don't want to speak for David Hatch, but um, if you do bump into Dave, um, he, he has a lot to tell you about the Zimmerman telegram and uh, related we've heard some two very good papers i think uh and the one theme that i think uh resonates in both is the pioneering nature of cryptologic uh techniques uh, and procedures for collection and analysis and the hard part is convincing the commander that the information is actually valid and a lot of times that depends on the analyst, but it also depends on the commander. And the thing that I would emphasize with Franklin Roosevelt in particular is not only was he a student of naval history, but he, he also had experience, practical experience uh, from the First World War uh, in dealing with uh, cryptologic information that was provided to him by the British. Uh, the one thing I would, I would uh, stress in Paul's presentation that I think is important is the British dimension of, of all of this uh, after the Panay sinking in particular. Uh, the Singapore conference, which happened shortly after that incident, uh, 
there, there were American representatives that went to that conference to meet with the British, and the one thing that they were concerned about was being manipulated again by the British. So we have to think about the First World War as we think about how things unfold in the Second War. Betsy's presentation, I think, brings out uh, some really fun stuff. Uh, in some respects, as you hear about the threadbare uh, realities of signals intelligence and cryptography in the First World War period, uh, I think one could get excited about it, you know, and, and want to be part of it uh, at that time, a hundred odd years ago. Uh, it's the Wild West. You're, you're building something new. Uh, you, you, you start developing tactics, techniques, and procedures that don't exist. Uh, by the time you get to 1937, you have organizations in the Army and the Navy that are designed specifically to do those things, but still the uh, ever-present reality of bureaucracy remains uh, the, the challenge for the analysts to convince the commander on a certain course of action. So uh, with those summary remarks, I hope I've encapsulated what I, what I think we heard today uh, in, in useful terms. Uh, we'll go ahead and open the floor for questions. Um, so, well, I have a question. If <laughs> nobody else, is there any other questions out there in the in the ether? Did I say it right? Ether, ether. There's something in chat. Let's see. My warning. That I warning. I, see, nobody got our warnings. Just like at Pearl Harbor. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I wore my funny jacket. I hope I'm funny. No? Yes? Good. Okay, no questions. I have a question. Yes. What is the difference between a code and a cipher? <laughs> okay. A code is generally a representation of a word or a phrase in one dictionary-based word that can be enciphered in and of itself. A cipher generally changes every letter in a word. A very simple, but... So when I first got into the cryptologic history uh, field, the first thing that happened is um, all the books that were being published is, look at the new history that we've just discovered, brand new, never heard it before, I found a UFO. Um, when, when you look at the history, historiography, uh, the history's kind of been there for us, but the granular uh, information wasn't. Uh, and so I, I've been schooled on this question of the difference between a cold code and a cipher by my cryptologic friends. Uh, uh, Rick Erskine, in particular, wrote a treatise to me about the difference, and he said how important that is. Now, as a historian, I have to say it's not all that important. <laughs> but, but, but from a practitioner standpoint i think that's important um and and, and we should as historians understand these well, it, it's important in the early days because in world war one particularly germany they were you're using a lot of codes and we've trained people to break ciphers instead of codes so they're really sort of befuddled when they then encounter codes and you know, William and Elizabeth Friedman trained several, quite a few military officers at Riverbank who went to France, but they trained them in cipher work. And then Friedman gets there and he's a cipher expert and he's put in charge of the code section and has to learn about codes, which different techniques. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I, that I learned in my journey in the cryptologic world is that the Titanic sinking actually had had an important influence on I, communication. Just as important. Oh, really? Yeah. It is not the first use of SOS. Oh, I, I, I know that. Okay. What, what, where I'm going, <laughs> right. CQD and, that, and yeah. then all of that. What I'm talking about is standardization yep. in communications sure. procedures. Uh, and if our panelists might be able to weigh in on this, uh, standardization question. Yeah, I mean, radio is still so new. In the early, I mean, I think the first use in war of radio was in the Boer War, just a mm -hmm. few years after the patent, Marconi gets his patent. And then by the Russo-Japanese War, you've got both sides using radio and both sides doing radio intercept. 
which is really the first time we see radio intercept. So it's really still very new and the technology is new and we're still getting to a point where we're setting up standards and procedures. Right. And you borrow a lot from the standards and procedures used by telegraph operators. You know, and, so. and if I can riff for two seconds, um, how did William Friedman break into magic? It was looking for patterns. And if you have the same thing being repeated over and over again, sooner or later, you can figure out what is specific, isolated, and then extrapolate. Mm -hmm. One of the ways that we were so successful finally in the mid-war going into the Battle of the Atlantic and going after the German submarines was essentially thanks to our raid capability to mm -hmm. ascertain yeah. that certain consulates around the world that had the Enigma attached were actually broadcasting mm -hmm. the weather. And the weather is standard and you can queue in. Uh, Friedman in, in dealing with the Japanese codes was queuing into a specific atypic from the pattern. And actually it was Genevieve Groch and Feinstein who made the first break against Purple. There and the go. team that Friedman ran, Friedman didn't make that first break. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so the other ones, we do have a question in the room for you. But okay. the, I, want, I want to just tell you that the Cribs and the Sillies and the Eins are... are, are are some other ones that come to mind, you know, the, the idea of break, it's a, it's like wheel of fortune, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's a skill. <laughs> so. This is so much a question, it's more of a comment, but in, in speaking of early use of radio in wartime, well, it wasn't quite wartime, but uh, I seem to recall uh, that uh, the British, when they were exercising in the North Sea, in the, the their grand maneuvers in, I think, 1912 and 1913, mm -hmm. had a hell of a problem with uh, the Ger German ships and German transmitters on shore were just, you know, basically broadcasting on the radio on the World Navy Briefing Fleet just to, just to annoy them and like drown out their messages. To each other. It's a, it's the changing technology from the Spark radio to a continuous wave radio. I mean, Spark is, is all over the place. It really hinders. It's broadcasting in multiple directions, and it's broadcasting at ho relatively high power, and there's no way to discern between the people you want to hear and the people you don't want to hear. So, Yeah, the British and Germans have kind of worked out basics of uh, RDF work right before the First World War. I think if I'm remembering that from James Goldberg's book. And we have another question. Yes. Uh Betsy was uh, telling us all about the great war between the Army and the Navy during uh, World War I. Um, Paul, were you seeing any of that going in in the advance of World War II? And Dave, you might have to repeat my question. I heard the last half. Can you repeat the first half, please? Did you see the same trend as we were moving into the Second World War? In so far, I'm sorry, I'm it wasn't wasn't getting the fir first part of it. What trend is, or is she referencing? Go ahead and restate your whole question. Sorry. Uh, war between the Army and the Navy for capability, for power, for influence. Are you seeing that same trend in the lead up into World War II? In the early interwar period, yes. During, yes, in a political fashion, but at the same time, both branch services are impoverished during the war and they have to work together. They need to pull, pull their resources uh, to, to a certain degree to pay for the equipment. When you're coming for, further down the line of who's going to decrypt what on what day? Well, it's the, the famous example of magic. The army worked one set of days and the navy worked the other set of days and never the two should meet because we... Oh. Well, <laughs> well, do we have any other questions? Betsy, do you, do you have any parting remarks for us? Um, I don't know. Um, I appreciate everybody who turned out. I've got a little poster for my book that's coming out in March 2022. I have a question now. Betsy, I'd like you to tell us about your book. Uh, and tell us uh, when you think it's available and 
uh, specifically who the book is about. Okay, it's a biography of Parker Hitt, who wrote the Manual for the Solution of Military Ciphers while he was at the Army Signal School in the pre-World War I day. He was a engineer in training at Purdue University when he heard the call to service and quit school and went to Cuba, well, went to Long Island and then to Cuba, and then decided he liked the Army so much that he joined up permanently as a second lieutenant and went to the Philippines. So he had a lot of different military ventures. He is probably most well known in the World War I era for being the chief signal officer of the First Army and had an extraordinary career doing a lot more SIGINT than anybody has ever given him credit for in supervising the SIGINT people. Lived until 1971, was a major source for David Kahn and his writing of the Code Breakers about this period, and had a very interesting life. His wife, Genevieve, was the first woman to break codes and ciphers for the government on an unpaid basis in 1917 during the punitive expedition. So the book should be out in March, providing that the paper shortage doesn't delay it. <laughs> Publishers are having terrible time getting paper for publishing books. University Pre of the University Press of Kentucky. So. Mm. Well, I look forward to my signed copy. Of course. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. I, I uh, share an interest in that period with you, and I look forward to having many future conversations uh, on on our shared topic of interest there. Thank and you, David. I appreciate that. And with that, um, I'm, I'm just going to say we're done, unless there's any other questions. Uh, just one thing, uh, Elizabeth. Yes. Uh, if you could have your publisher send a copy of that to the Naval Historic Foundation for ah. review. Okay. I might have put you on the list already, but I will double check. Foundation. That, that's down at the Navy Yard. You can get the address online. Okay. Uh, on their... I will do that. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, Paul, any any parting shots before we call it? None that I can think of other than thanks again, everybody. Yeah, I, ap right. I apologize for Dave Hatch. I'm not quite sure what happened there. I've just checked my email. I don't have any messages from him. So something well, must have gone wrong. But Give my very best to Dave Hatch when you talk to him. And thank you both for excellent papers. Uh, I think it was a, 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 a nice exchange. So with that, can we have a, a bit of applause for us? So thank, thank you so much. And uh, stay healthy out there. Sorry we couldn't Bye. be there in person. <laughs> Next year. <laughs> Take All right. Uh, that's our presentation. Mm -hmm.